I am thrilled to have one of the most active participants in the Obsidian Forum joining us today. Uh, Brian Jenks not only showcases many tips on how to get the most out of Obsidian, both in the forum channels as well as on his own YouTube channel, but he also steps in to help a lot of people. In the forums, he answers a ton of questions related to note-taking and productivity. And outside of knowledge management, he does some awesome work helping people struggling with ADHD, sharing his own experiences and lessons learned. Brian, it's great to have you on today's program. Great to be here. Thanks for the invite. For sure. So before we jump into kind of, I know you're going to share your screen and show some awesome tips and tricks and things you've been doing. But before we get into that, how did you discover Obsidian? What were you using before that? You have a really impressive kind of flow you put together of how you manage and process all your inputs. And if I'm not mistaken, you have a full-time job. You got some, you're an entrepreneur doing some things on the side. You're full-time in school. You got a million things going on. Clearly, you have a lot of inputs coming in from many directions. How are you managing all that before? How did you discover Obsidian? What Give us a kind of a quick, what led you to where you are today? So for how I discovered Obsidian is a pretty short answer. Um, I was looking at Rome research just for, mm -hmm. because it was the hot thing and it was interesting. But when I, I was actually watching videos on his channel, I recently discovered called Notes with Ren. And she was showcasing Obsidian for academic note-taking. And I think she uses RemNote now, but I saw Obsidian on her channel and I started looking at it, joined the Discord server and uh, fell into the Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. uh, of obsidian yeah. and yeah I, I do have a million and one things going on school work full time i own two businesses and i contribute to open source whatever else i got a million things going on so with adhd i also ruthlessly manage my life with uh mainly two different applications but uh yeah i, I have lots of workflows and things that i rigidly stick to to manage my life and everything i have going on were you, were you always that way? So first of all, I appreciate all that you do, not only contributing to Obsidian, but, but to the world of ADHD and really helping people and your courage to, to kind of share. So have you always had systems or been working on systems or was that more of, I need to, I need to build, I need something here to, to manage what I'm doing. And was it more of kind of, you had to solve a pain? Um. When I was younger, I didn't, I wasn't really on medication for any of this much at all, and I didn't really get a lot of treatment for it. So it wasn't really, you know, very conscious of the idea that I needed to do anything. It was just, this is my normal. I'm just, you know, living my life. Yeah. And so I didn't really have this sort of focus on how can I optimize how I work to be more productive in a world that's not really designed for, you know, brains like mine. And so when I finally started working full time, which my first full time job was my current career uh, working for the public sector, I had to develop strategies to you know, be an effective employee and actually do my work. But um, the more I started looking at it, I like to optimize anything. I like to make, I like to squeeze every little bit of value out of something that I possibly can. So I was looking at how I best function and then choosing applications or workflows or thinking about how can I work with the way my brain works to, you know, not work against myself, not wear myself down, but work with how I work best and achieve more effective and more volume of output in a way that, you know, doesn't burn me out, but also helps me create and feel happy. Cool. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see, I've already seen, but I can't wait for you to showcase um, some of the, the awesome things that you're doing and, and the kind of the process flows. So where should we jump in here? You, you, you build a mermaid chart and maybe that, that'd be um, something to kind of, kind of show. One of the cool things about Obsidian, one of the many cool things about it is how flexible it is and how much you can do within it, including building your own flow charts, which you put together pretty much a, a I don't know if you built this in Obsidian or if you had it elsewhere, but a flow chart that basically says, here's all the stuff that's coming into my life, at least from a uh, content perspective, and here's how I manage it. And why don't you kind of show us that and maybe even how do you even, you know, what is Mermaid? How, how would one get started with it if we wanted to kind of build a flow chart? Um, just some basics. All right. Uh, yeah. Mermaid is a JavaScript Oh, look library. at that. 
graph. <laughs> Ooh, we're going to have to come back to that. That is beautiful. Thanks. Uh, Mermaid is actually a JavaScript library that the devs for Obsidian included. And it's it's basically a markup language for graph creation. So like if I was writing JavaScript code, you would just pass a string or just this text, not tags, not code. It's kind of just like markdown, but um, you would just pass this string basically and it would render a chart and it works in, and actually my first, uh, first time I came across Mermaid was actually when I'm, I was working with R Markdown because I do a lot of um, analysis and analytics and reporting with R Markdown. So I actually use this sometimes to detail some of my process flows in that. And so I've used it before. And so, yeah, it's a, a JavaScript library with a specific Markdown syntax for chart generation. Now, the way you use it in Obsidian and in general Markdown, uh, specifications that support it is you have a code fence with the three back ticks and you just say mermaid. Normally this is where you say the programming language like yep. JavaScript or Python, but then you can also give it like the general, you know, what graph type. So in this case, it's a top to bo um, top down graph or I think that's what it is. I forget what the, exactly the acronyms are. I only use like one or two of them, but in any case, it's basically just a points to B. And then you could do another line where B points to C, C points to D, and you can just point it at different uh, nodes. So I have you know test going to also test and all of this stuff. So like all of these are just like thought experiments of like what can Mermaid do? You can even do pie charts, but um, it's a very simple syntax. You don't need to look at this and get confused. It's really just the uh, the, the capital letters here are the names of the nodes, and then you know what do they look like and what text are within them. So the little Parens makes it a rounded edge. So different shapes, different text inside, and then you just give it a unique name and point it at other things. And that's what creates the flow. Cool. Yep. And you can embed this right within existing notes. Um, mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be its own standalone thing. You know, Brian could put text before and after around those and, and you would see right within, you know, just a, a general note that you can have this mermaid code right in there. Yep. Very cool. All right, so you used Mermaid to develop a pretty darn impressive uh, process flow for yourself in managing your kind of input. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, kind of hard so, to put on the screen. <laughs> yeah. So what are we looking at here? And, and what led to the creation of this? So developing my workflows, uh, we, we get content and input from a variety of sources. So it might, you might be watching YouTube videos, you might be listening to podcasts, you might read a book, you might read research papers. Uh, I consume all of these different types of media and I wanted to have a specific go-to place where I could you know, just get it out of my head. That's a big thing with like ADHD is I don't want to hold things in my head. I want to just get it out so I can refer back to it later, but it doesn't take up basically biological RAM. I don't want my, my memory or my, my RAM being taken up by things that I could just put over there and reference. And it frees up my cognitive load for actual thinking. So I just said, hey, I have something coming in, something I want to review, consume, read, listen to, watch, whatever. And then depending on what type of media, it'll follow a pathway through you know, how I co process content. So it's basically just, I have an input and then these are all the avenues of processing and they all lead to the same place, which is I put the notes from those items in Obsidian. And this isn't like the evergreen notes or the Zettel Costin notes that everyone uh, is you know, buzzing about. It's just, hey, I took notes on, like you might take notes in a class. Like I'm reading an article. Oh, that's an interesting little factoid. I'm just gonna put that there. Oh, a little bit more about that. Okay, just bullet points, literature notes. And then like, from those, they just develop over time. I could take those literature notes and if I like it well enough, convert that directly into the name of a new note, or I could just review that material, think about it, think about how my current vault is set up and what I have in there and how that content relates to what I currently have, and then develop new ideas. Those ideas become their own notes and over time they mature. And uh, the reason why my video is an hour long is because it's jam packed, but it's, it's a very meticulous and detailed process of how I actually graduate notes from different categories of maturity, such as inbox inputs, seedlings, um, things that are in the incubator, and then evergreen notes that, that I will plant in my evergreen forest. It's a lot of gardening analogy, but a great way of looking at that, that is 
all of these. And, and just uh, real quick before before uh, Brian continues, so we'll put a link so that video. So Brian has several videos on his on his, that are awesome on his YouTube channel. We'll put a link at the end of this to the video that he's referring to, but it's a deep dive walkthrough on what what he's showing here that is well worth uh, watching to to get a ton of tips and tricks. Some of which we'll we'll extract out here in this video. So we'll include that link. So sorry, Brian. I'm actually really surprised because that's actually my most popular video on YouTube and I've been doing this for over a year now. So yeah, I'm like, that's, Ooh. yeah, it's awesome. But my content that are my notes that I put in here will graduate from just like an input, which is just a, a new research paper I'm taking notes on, the ideas generated from it. Then once I have a bunch of ideas that are now little seedling notes, they're not connected to anything. They're just floating out in space. Then I, then I will then start working on one. It's just a title. So now I need to flesh out, okay, the name of this note is something like, you know, it, hyperfocus and ADHD is a double-edged sword of productivity and avoidance, which actually is a note of mine. Yeah. And then as I flesh that out, think about it, and then really put some you know, deep thought into that, then it's an incubator because now it's, you know, it's been developed, it's growing, I need to make this mature. So then you start, okay, connect any other useful ideas. What can I connect this to? Where do I want to stumble upon this in my vault? Connect it to those notes. Now that it's connected, it's part of the vault. It's you know interwoven with everything else. So now it's an evergreen note. I can return to it. I can develop it as time goes on, but it now has a home and it's been planted. So that's basically how I you know, get my notes from different content and it all, the processing steps change based on the type of input but the ultimate goal, once it, I get the notes from the, that input, is all the same for everything else. So it's really just, these are all the ways um, I process different pieces of content, and then the input and the output is always the same. And, and the evergreen concept is an, an homage to Andy Matuszek and what he, what he built with his, uh, his really impressive kind of workflow there. Yep. Yeah, Andy Matuszek yep. is... Yep. I, I, I have subscription to his uh, Twitter account. Like I get notifications from him because yeah. I love what he's doing. He's, so he's a, he's he a brilliant out. thinker, a brilliant thinker. It's uh, anyone who's not heard of him, check him out. Not only a brilliant thinker, but a um, just a deep character, really, really impressive uh, individual. Check out his work and, and what he's done in <laughs> pretty much in, in a lot of different areas right now. I've been going through the uh, quantum country essay. It's a really interesting experiment he's doing around space repetition and learning that is fascinating. And any, anyone who's listening to this who has any interest in, in physics and quantum physics and quantum computing, uh, check it out. It's, it's really darn impressive. And his note-taking format, the way that the panes slide across, it's just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I, mean, I use it because I really enjoy how with like Zettelkasten, and that's I actually have a note about that as well. Is that the downside of using these digital these digital tools is that unlike having analog note cards that you can spread out on your desk and review all at once, you can't really easily do that mm -hmm. with digital notes. So with this way, you're able to easily lay them all out on your desk, quote unquote, and review them and have the same sort of benefit in a way. And we'll come back to what Brian was just showing, because that's a, a new feature in Obsidian, which is a, a plugins. And that's a plugin that Brian is using that he'll showcase a little bit later on how you get started with plugins. But that's a plugin that lets him use that sliding panel, quote, Andy Matuchak mode within Obsidian, which is cool. But anyway, back to your, your process flow. My best example is actually uh, the books right now. But um... Cool. I'm actually really, really behind on my content processing. So, because, you know, a lot going on. And, and, but, what kind, um, and so, yeah, go through that um, real quick. And, and also tell us uh, some of the books that you're reading that you're actually consuming or okay. that you want to that are on your wish list as well. Yes. Um, I actually, uh, so my workflow for physical books, it's basically the same as research papers, except that sometimes. You know, books are not necessarily more dense. They can be more dense, but there's just more volume to them. So I might, depending on the complexity or how dense the book is in material, uh, break it out to chapters. So this yeah. workflow of going through the physical book and all of this workflow, if the book is really dense, I'll just repeat this for like every chapter. 
So I don't, you know, read the whole thing cover to cover. And then I've lost all of my initial trains of yeah. thought from the beginning. So do you prefer good, physical yeah. books or digital books? Um, if it's a long form book, I prefer physical. If it's something like a research paper, I prefer digital. Interesting. But, uh, my primary example in here, the one that everyone probably by now has a note for is uh, how to take, how smart, to take notes. smart notes. I knew it. I knew it was coming. <laughs> yeah, it's a great book. As far as like my book note taking process for this one, this isn't normally what I do, but I was actually reading this up in the mountains. So I was handwriting my notes like uh, Nicholas Luhmann might have done. Yeah, but um, I, I actually hand wrote all these notes and then transcribed them when I got home. Yeah, I have templates for every type of media that I have. So like my book template might have this metadata up top. Um, I have the BibTeX reference just because I might want that. Um, and just I to interject use... quickly. So a template is something that you can save in Obsidian. When you create a new note, you can say, open this template. So it fills in, in, in Brian's case there, all that header information, rather than him having to type out that sort of thing, it'll just drop in a template there. And there is his book, that template. Yep. yep, the raw text, but right when I create a new one, I can just drop this template in and all of my information is right there for me, ready to fill in. And yeah, I make prolific use of templates. I got tons of them. But yeah, I, I store the BibTeX reference here just because sometimes I want to see the reference or I just want to, I want all the, the metadata up at the top. I do use uh, Zotero and the whole Zotero yeah. workflow for all of this um, reference management eventually. And you show examples of that in your, in your lengthy video on how, mm -hmm. to, how to use that and, and integrate that. And that's really cool. I'm actually going to be filming um, a couple more videos on specific pieces of that workflow in more detail because some of the people in the server have asked me for some more detail. So I'm good. actually going to be filming some more videos on that too. That's great. Um, yeah, and, and the, a really cool thing that, that Brian shows in that video as well is how to annotate PDFs within mm -hmm. that that makes it pretty nice for using that for your, your reference library and then consuming that within Obsidian. I can't take credit for any of that workflow, though, just because I found it on the forums, but it uses a couple yeah. Zotero plugins to basically annotate PDFs in Zotero and then export those notes to Markdown that you can just copy and paste into Obsidian. So it's really, really helpful for just getting everything to plain text. And we all stand on the shoulders of, of giants who, who came before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the cool thing is not... Um, copying, the cool thing is extending. How can you take... And that's, and that's the whole point of of your seedlings and your evergreen notes is how can I take thoughts and then that other people have inspired within me and then expand on them to create my own thoughts and my own additions on top of that. Because at the end of the day, what we're here to do is contribute and make a difference in some way. And we do that by building on, on the great things that have come before us. Yeah, I don't see anybody else out there making their own silicon chips to build their own computer, to exactly. build software. It's like <laughs> We all, we all rely on other people and what they've created. But uh, with the book, the way I took notes for this book was if I had uh, some ideas that came from a specific page, I wasn't copy and pasting unless it was a direct quote, which is formatted as a direct quote, but I would say what page. So if I ever want to refer back to it, I can always yep. jump directly to the page, reread that page and know exactly like where I found or what was inspired by this idea. And I just took bullet point notes and over time, I, when I reviewed these notes a couple of times, some of these notes that I took, the text that I wrote directly just became the name of some of my new seedling notes, such as, um, like this one, the bot that bottom up writing prevents confirmation bias and provides a shorter and iterative feedback loop. Let's, let's pause on that for one second, because I really like that. I too, and what I'm, what I'm referring to is a lengthy note title, actually a mm -hmm. sentence and actually a declarative sentence, if you will. And what I like about it is that when you look at it, it's pretty darn clear what this note is about versus, uh, say, the note being called bottom-up writing, just as an example. Talk a little bit about, is, do you do this with all your notes? Do you, you tend mm -hmm. to have? That's, that's terrific. Yeah, the, the th reason I do this for a couple of reasons. One, because if I wanted to, I could easily just 
reference this in a sentence inline note references, like you can see in the drop down here. You know, I just referenced Zettel Kosten in here, but some of these longer note titles, if they're directly applicable, I just put them in line. I don't have them all referenced at the bottom only. Like sometimes you yep. can just put them in right in line. Two, uh, this actually makes them uniquely identified. A lot of people still get hung up on the Zettel Kosten prefixer, which is that you know year, month, day, hour, minutes, just the, the long unique timestamp. But the the reason that we use digital systems is that we don't have to worry about having unique identifiers for anything anymore because of all of the other stuff that goes along with that, UIDs and whatnot. But with this, I have a unique note title. Nothing's going to be the same as this. If it is the same, then I probably just need to add it to this note. Yeah. Uh, the only con with this that I've ran across so far is that it, it, sometimes it can get annoying if you're zoomed in on the graph. <laughs> right. Yeah, it does put a lot of text on yeah. there. One other pro as well is when you're searching uh, when you want to embed the note, it's pretty clear when you're, yeah, exactly, that, oh, yes, this is the note I want versus bottom-up note-taking. Is it this one? I don't remember. And now I have to go in and look to see what did I write about that? So, yeah. Yeah, I like actually using the quick launcher to just pull out note titles instead of having to go through the search pane to search for content right. inside the notes. So find, finding the note title that way, just it's a lot faster for me, and I like that too. Cool. Going through the book, as I took these notes, transcribed them into my system, graduated you know, a bullet point, maybe two. Um, for instance, I could just say this is directly the name of a note. But in the, what actually happened is that I did not want to make this the title of the note. So I might do a sub bullet and actually create a brand new you know, note title. But I want to reference that it came from this idea. So either I could just graduate something that I directly took as the name of a note, or I generate a new one. But one of the important things about the way I did this here is that I've actually linked to every note that came from this book within the notes for this book. So I actually have a daily note, which I use sort of in the way that a lot of Rome users use their daily note, where everything stems from that. Yep. So in my daily note, it's mostly my private journal, so I'm not going to show anything, but I will also say, oh, yeah, and today I read How to Take Smart Notes, yep. which links to this page, which then links to all, all these notes, which then links to all the notes that they're connected to. So in that case, I actually have a temporal component to my notes, so I can actually follow what things I read on what day and see you know, any sort of interconnectedness with that. But in this case, everything flows down top to bottom from daily lit note to actual evergreen note or whatever stage of uh, processing it's in. And the cool thing about that is wherever any note that Brian would reference the date, let's say today's date, for instance, in, he could then search for the date and it would not only show the, it, it would show every note that contains that date within it, uh, whether it's mm -hmm. linked or not, because it would find unlinked references as well, which is kind of a cool thing. Again, back to your point of, you really don't need to use that Ocostin sort of prefixes because these everything will get pulled up, you know, based on you know whatever kind of tagging system you want to use or not, it'll find it anyway. Between tagging and just just search, just being able to search through content or by the names of notes, you can find whatever you're looking for pretty easily. And if you're into the command line like I am, like I could just easily grip out some text from my entire vault and know exactly where it is, what line it's on, and I'm good. So. Yeah, it's and that's, that's probably worth say. another series because I think that's <laughs> kind of a, a cool thing that, that people would like to be able to do, which is being able to, to process fi all, your, all your notes from the command line using you know, basic Unix-like syntax to be able to do that is not difficult and it's fairly easy to learn and it's so powerful on what you can do with that. Yeah, if you live, uh, if you use Linux, and you can you can live in the terminal, and it's yeah. it's what I did for a, a good probably a year, and it's I got super comfortable with it. It's like it's like second nature now. I love doing things in the terminal because it's made for text processing because that's what yeah. all we had back in the day. Yeah. All right, cool. So, so all right, so you have this this note, and so some of these turn into seedlings. Some of them eventually become evergreen notes in your system. Do you keep seedlings and evergreen notes in separate folders what sort of structure do you you keep it's one flat pretty much flat sort of that's that's cool so the that's why you pretty much I keep use... your left panel sort of 
collapse because you don't need to get to folders. You do a quick search to get to anything you want or your links. Um, it depends. So they're collapsed right now because I'm just presenting. But um, I actually do have uh, workspaces for different things. So if I'm just going to walk into my uh, vault, I could say, go to home. And that's where my panes are open. I drop into my index and everything's available to me. Mm -hmm. I see Nick Milo's sort of maps of content in there, or at least semblances of that. It's cool. Yeah, I don't do uh, a lot of the Dewey Decimal system mm -hmm. or a lot of the numbering for anything because the numbering would actually make it sort in the vault. And what mm -hmm. I really need is not necessarily the names in here sorted because I don't use this for navigation. I'm using search and the it, it's kind of a, a little bit, it's a lot uh, to explain, but really I, I like to just link to specific uh, titles like business. It's yeah, that's my business map of content that links to other business related notes, but it's also a quote unquote tag. The tags yeah. that everyone uses, the hashtag and then the words, I don't use those at all. I don't I either. Use, yeah. I use my tags with emojis just because it's you know fun. Yep. But uh, I use that to indicate status of the note uh, yep. processing, evergreen yep. or seedling or whatever. The way I use tags is I use the names of something like interests or business or statistics. That's a single word but that's my tag. I tag this as statistics, but then what happens is when I get to my graph over time, and as I hit critical mass of notes, I could say, oh, what's this note? Uh, let's find one there, spaced repetition. So spaced repetition here, you know, right now that's just, you know, a, a tag. I tag that, it does, the file doesn't exist. It's a, it's a little red note, plagiarism, friendship, uh, whatever. So these, these could be notes that don't exist. I tag them with something. A million things tagged with Unix means I probably need to make a map of content for mm -hmm. things that are related right. to Unix. So over time, when I see those connections build up, I could say, ah, that needs to actually become a part of this growing map because a lot of things are about that. And so that's what's happened with ADHD, uh, subtle cost and space repetition. So then they become their own map of content and I you know, add it in. But over time, you can see some of these don't exist yet productivity, learning, knowledge, they might eventually. And then when I go back to my index, they will get added to here and eventually the growing maps of content. Again, mermaid chart. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I use tags or lack thereof the same way as you that I use everything more as links and implied tags, if you will, with that. But, you know, another powerful thing about Obsidian is you can use it however you want, A and B, you're not locked in. You know, do something that nope. you think will work for you. And if it doesn't, it's so easy to change. And if you learn some of the, some of the grep or bash script types of uh, capabilities, which are not hard to learn, you can, you can pretty much switch from any system to another within a matter of minutes. I actually had to do that a couple of times. I wanted to change all of my tagging systems. So I actually used uh, the said stream editing to replace throughout my entire vault in a single command, all the instances of certain tags with mm -hmm. the emoji characters. Mm -hmm. And you know, it took a couple of seconds. I didn't have to edit hundreds of files one by That's one. Right. That, ain't nobody got time for that. Yeah. <laughs> Typically what it might look like if I'm refactoring things, you know, developing, fleshing out notes or re-editing um, certain items, uh, it could just be randomly searching. So I could randomly search for something that just came to top of mind. Like for instance, I got some things here top of mind that I wanted to do or get around to doing. Um, I have some more statistics notes I actually want to flesh out. I need to fix some of the metadata on some of the other things. And then just some other general to do things I want to get around to. But uh, when I'm actually like doing work in here, I would just, if it's just random, I could go to uh, open random note and then I open up a random note and then I can go, cool. go and edit that. And that's one of the things I like about you know, using digital software versus the analog system is, yeah, you could just go and pick a random card out of your box. But just being able to click a button and have a random note presented to you is incredibly useful for discovery because then you can use your local graph and then see whatever it's connected to. And so I could have you know, a note open and then my local graph open as well follow statistics and then say, hmm, okay, what's connected to here? What's displaying? Uh, I wanna see anything that's connected to, I wanna see tags, attachments, cool. And I can just traverse around in here and say, let's go to there, it's connected to that. And just, you know, 
follow the pathway. And that's usually how I edit things unless I have like a, an overarching purpose, like I need to change the metadata on some of my programming notes. But uh, a lot of what I have been doing lately, as I said, uh, I'm kind of behind a lot on my content processing because I have so much going on. But one thing I have been doing recently is I'm still in school. So I'm taking notes on C++ because I'm in a class. And this is not the typical, you know, people have been talking about this a lot in the Discord server for Obsidian about how do you use more academic notes versus just I'm generating ideas about reading research mm -hmm. papers and going to write my own articles and books with those ideas and following what, what how to take smart notes outlines mm -hmm. as the output. So yeah, that's a really great idea of output. And one thing I've talked about with my statistics notes in particular is, and that is more of a close like middle ground relation is I could take idea notes just as how everyone else thinks about like what, how to take smart notes outlines, read a literature article, take literature notes, develop your ideas, make those notes, connect them, have a creative output, write an article. Cool. One thing I'm doing with my statistics notes is that as I flesh those out and I read research papers that might say, hey, uh, the P value for this was three mm -hmm. point whatever, and we use this statistical test and this method, I can link to my statistics notes, those methods that were used. And over time, maybe that might actually highlight a potential issue in that paper through their statistical process. I don't remember what is a p-value? What is the right. exact definition? Exactly. What is the granular pieces that build up into a p-value? All of those notes are linked to each other. The mean uh, references the, uh, the range, references standard deviation, variance, you know, all that stuff. So in that case, more of the formal structured content can actually relate to your ideas. And one thing I do with like my software notes here is I have classes in C++, so like C++ classes link actually to Python classes mm -hmm. and Python classes link back to C++. So in this yep. case, I could see the implementation of classes across languages. So I can see for all the languages I have notes on, how do they relate to each other? One of the really cool things about this is that you're not just learning and consuming information you are synthesizing it with either real example, like the research example of, of, you know, the statistical kinds of components of taking what you're learning in research and applying them to actual research papers and actual statistical anal analyses and, and how that works. Same thing with programming languages. Okay, I'm learning this kind of structure and this, you know, this class structure. And what does this look like in another language and how would I use it in this? And clearly, we retain information so much better when we, when we play with it, when we squeeze it, when we challenge it, when we synthesize it. So you're making it much more tangible and real, but not only do we retain the information so much better that way, it's far more likely that we'll be able to apply it in novel circumstances because it's now become part of our, our internal knowledge base, if you will, and because of that synthesis. So that's really cool what you're doing there. A lot of the, I actually read a couple of papers about space repetition and learning in general. And some of the really interesting things that I've found from that is when it comes to memory and managing information and keeping it in your long-term memory. Yeah. Everyone is hearing about space repetition. It's getting really hot right now. Anki and super memo, whatever. But one really useful thing that's talked about by the guy who developed Super Memo is relating information back to what you already know. So if I want to learn a new novel piece of information, some of the strategies that people might do for that are, hey, uh, I need to remember C++ classes and something ridiculous about that. So let's just pick case statements. I could say something ridiculous. So I'm like trying to remember um, a specific piece of information. And so I could say case statements Okay, how do I want to remember something about case statements? Uh, let's think about a police case. What about a police case? It was a violent police case. There was something really horrible and violent. And it sounds really bad, but the advice is the more shocking or true. You know, the more it's related graphic. to your baser instincts, yeah. graphic, yep. link it into your long-term memory or relating it to something you already know. Like, oh, I remember Derek in accounting actually told me about case statements when he was studying that class that one time. That associates it to Derek in accounting. That associates it to that specific time memory. And, you know, cementing that knowledge and then linking it to existing knowledge like an Obsidian Vault, incredibly useful for retaining, especially when you're not just copy and pasting this stuff. A great book on that that I read many, many years ago is called Moonwalking with Einstein by Josh Four. It's an excellent book. And he actually 
he actually used the techniques in that book to enter memory competition and actually win, if I'm not mistaken. It was meant a long time ago when I read that book. Actually win, but he talks about how the world's best memory experts retain it. And it's exactly along the lines of, of, of what you're describing there. I'll be checking that out. Yeah. All right, cool. So yeah, the way that, that you synthesize information across your classes is, is, is really, have you noticed a difference in the, the way that you retain information from your schooling in the past to now with using these types of structures and systems you've put in place? A uh, massive improvement. Uh, I used to, actually, I never really struggled too much in school um, just because I, I just didn't really find a lot of the material really challenging. And even though I was in some accelerator programs, it was just more of busy work to me. I didn't really enjoy it. But what I'm doing now is now that I'm actually like interested in the idea of learning and learning how to learn, I'm much more invested. And so, I mean, if you're more invested, you're obviously going to get more benefits. So I don't, I'm not really sure if there's like a, a correlation causation relationship or if it's just now that I actually care, I'm actually getting more out of it. But I do notice that when I actually cared about things, like when I was just starting my career, trying to learn a specific programming language to now, whereas before I just read a bunch of books and hoped that some of that stuff stuck in there and then tried to learn by doing, now doing things this way, I've actually been able to link it to you know, similar information. I'm actually using it in projects. And then it's actually being able to, I can just pick that right out of the top of my mind and just be like, oh yeah, I know that concept. I know that that uh, vectors in C++ are just better arrays or why you shouldn't use namespace STD for standard library. Like some of this stuff is just there now. Yep. And it's been a lot, it's been a much easier experience with some of this material now than before. That's cool. Being a little more provocative with it. If you're going to spend the time to learn something, why not commit it to permanent memory versus it just being throwaway? One thing I thought so, about that was the idea of, because I'm in the server, people talk about how how do you relate this to what everyone thinks that your Zettelkasten should look like of just your ideas? How do we put this like factual information, this rigid structured information into here? And I was thinking, you know, I actually do want this in here because what if I randomly search it one day and it, it interests me, that's cool. But if this whole, the whole idea of this is to build a second brain where all of your knowledge is stored, one, doing this will actually help you learn it by one, spaced repetition of typing it out, two, interconnectedness of connecting it to related topics, and three, if you ever want to reference this, and this is one thing that I've done very often, is I actually wanted to look at something about Python again, and I'm like, hey, I could search Google, or I could see the example that I wrote specifically to myself that I knew I would understand easily when seeing a code snippet, the implementation, the output, that's already in there. I could just go to Python and it's there. I want to look at classes, their implementation, it's there and all the things that I need to know about it. And if a quick review, I'm up to speed again. And this is here forever for me. Who's to say what Nicholas Luhmann would have done today, you know, with a system like, like Obsidian, but given the, the lack of pain, the lack of cost, hard to imagine he would have separated out literature notes and that he would have had trouble wondering, is this my thought or is this somebody else's thought? You actually just gave me an idea that I had to write down in my uh, top of mind so I don't forget about it later. But something that about the top level structure of Obsidian, like you asked me if I put things in specific folders beyond what I'm required to, like the daily yeah. notes, yeah. just for like for uh, a single place for that media and my templates. Yep. Um, I have these two for YouTube videos and medium articles for my creative output stuff. But other than that, everything's at top level. Yep. And one thing in the server that I've noticed for Obsidian users is that people struggle with the idea of getting away from nested folder hierarchies and the top level structure. And I did too. Originally, I was all the folders, everything. But now I've actually started to enjoy and prefer top level structure. And I figured out why. I at least, and maybe if many others had such a struggle with this paradigm shift, is that in ADHD, something that is common with babies is object impermanence. You you hold, you know, playing peekaboo with a baby, it's, it yep. surprises them every time because once right. your face is gone, you don't exist. That's right. 
So with ADHD, there actually is an issue with that. And so one thing that actually annoys my girlfriend is that when I have something, I want to have everything laid out invisible. Otherwise I forget that it exists. You put your vegetables in the crisper in your refrigerator, they're going to rot for me because I'll forget they exist. And so when you don't have folders and know where to find things and they're all organized, sometimes you, know, you prefer the folders because you know it, that's exactly where that goes. It's all in that folder. Everything I need to know about it is in that folder. Just seeing a giant pile is stressful. But actually, with the power of search, tags and you know, the, the linking and the graphs, like top level doesn't bother me anymore. And it's right. become something I've actually come to prefer because now I don't even need to stress about organizing everything. There is no organization. It's just a pile. And, and that's a big challenge, I think, with, with para systems and Notion, which, which are very powerful um, systems. But it forces you to, you know, you talk about how to take smart notes. It forces you to think like an archivist. Where does this note belong? Versus forget about thinking like an archivist. You mentioned it before. Think about how would I want to stumble upon this note in the future? Then it doesn't matter where it is. It's just linking to it, providing the links to it, and coming up with those declarative titles that you use for your notes that, that also make it much clearer what it is that, that you're referring to and how you want to reference it. Lots of big titles. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we'll probably get a feature to be able to cut it down you know, in the graph to display only like 50 characters. And then when you hover over it, see the full title type of a thing. And I'm sure that will come. I actually kind of that prefer happens. seeing it that way. I actually just changed some of my graph settings. So I really have to zoom in on a node to see it. Oh, yeah. But that way I could easily be close and follow relationships and mm -hmm. then just hover if I want to see it. So I've actually made it work for me. One thing I noticed, and you talk about this in your video, and I think it's a, it's a clever idea. Tell us why you use an ampersand before your little mini CRM that you have built into the system here when you refer to people? Oh, yes. Um, so I use certain uh, special characters. There's a number of them that are actually supported in the titles of the notes. Only one of them I've actually had to change, which was research paper, which was the caret symbol. But since we got the block level references, I had to yep. change that. I do this for each of these are different types of inputs. So I mentioned my whole mermaid workflow, each different type of input has their own special special character before the name of the note. So my daily note for today, today's the 30th of October, it would be you know 2020-10-30. So what I do with my literature notes from every input source is I do their special character. Then I put the date I actually you know, completed or just the when I actually consumed that content and wrote my literature notes, and then the name of that article, video, whatever. And that's it. It's just special character, unique, the, the date I finished it, and then the name of it. And so what that lets me do is that this works with people too. But with books, for instance, I only have how to take smart notes in here right now because I'm behind on my reading. But if I did my search and I could start typing, you know, how to... It's in there, but it's down at the bottom. And there's a bunch of other stuff in there because there's a lot of how-to things I watch, apparently. Mm -hmm. So if I just did my special character, which is the um, left curly brace, it's the only option that comes up. It'll show me all my books. If I have oh. tweets, it'll show me yeah. those. If I have research papers, it'll show me only those. And this way, I can easily filter out just the content. And from here, I could say, actually, let's do, yeah, so how and then I could filter from the text there. I don't need to use the, yep. do the date, but that special character at the front actually makes searching easy to just cut down the amount of content you're looking at ease, uh, and make the search easy. And I do the and same thing for people. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great, you know, another reason why you can have all your notes in one place because there's so many techniques you can use to like this to easily be able to, to search and filter. And again, if you change your mind, so, you know, tell us, Brian, when you changed from using a carrot to main ampersand for a research paper, how long did that change, you know, take you to, to switch your notes up and, and to change that? Um, for now, uh, it was, I didn't have to change too many of them. So instead of writing a long script or having to do anything else, I actually just changed them manually right here. Yeah. Okay. Well, but if I had a lot to yeah. change... If I had a lot to change, what I would actually do is I have um, 
a file browser in my terminal called Ranger that I can actually use to, you know, select all of my notes, put them into a Vim buffer, and then, you know, a couple key commands, change the first character, save it, and now all the files are renamed. So, I mean, if, if I wanted to uh, spend a little bit more, a slight amount more of me mental effort, I could easily mm -hmm. do it with, you know, a couple, a couple things in the command line. But You I just do love manually. command line. That's, mm -hmm. that's cool. Okay, so you were saying I interrupted you. I'm sorry. For person, you use the, the at symbol there. Yep, yeah, that's the first thing. That's just for because so many other like applications and uh, anything else all use the the at yeah. symbol for referencing people or an at mention. So yeah. I just did the same thing. So that way I could also, if I'm in a note, I can just say um, from here I want to reference Nicholas Lumen in mm -hmm. Andy Matushak because yep. you know note taking stuff. So I could just do you know the link and then an at symbol and then it just shows me all the people I might want to link. Yep. And then I could just do. Nicholas Milo, uh, Nicholas Milo, yeah. uh, Nicholas Lumen, and then there you go. So it's yep. that that easy. So it's the same sort of concept, but the people is the only thing that I link that way. Um, everything else is just my content inputs. Speaking of content inputs, you consume a lot of articles, and one cool hack that I saw in your video is how to consume a lot of Medium articles without hitting the. Uh, the, uh, the medium limit if you don't have a professional subscription uh, for that, which I thought was, yes. was very clever. And you use, is it Raindrop that you use? Yes, I use Raindrop as my uh, inbox for all of my uh, content out here. So I have, I have like three main inboxes, uh, sort of. If I'm watching YouTube videos, I just use my watch later list. If I'm using, if it's research papers or books, it's a physical book, so it's, it's in my house. If it's a research paper, it's in Zotero, and then anything else, it's in Raindrop. So I know exactly where to go for all of my inputs. They're all localized in you know, one place for its type. So I use Raindrop a lot. As you can tell, I'm, uh, I'm just gonna keep reiterating, I'm really behind. Um, but there's, there's a, a lot of articles to... in there. And I did, a, I did this on stream. I actually went through on a live stream through my articles and I, I knocked out like 40 or 60 of them mm -hmm. just because a lot of them weren't really meaty. And yeah, like I, they just keep going back up because I don't have time. But for getting, uh, you know, I'm, hopefully nobody gets in trouble for this, but if you want to get around the medium paywall, there's a couple strategies you can do. <laughs> you could uh, you use Raindrop because by clicking on a medium article, you've added to Raindrop, which is free. There's a free plan for Raindrop. You can actually read these articles in Raindrop and they usually open up. I'm not sure why this one's not doing it, but you can actually read them in Medium or in, in Raindrop. Now, if you wanted to not use Raindrop, you could also just use a, a private window of your browser, same, same thing, or clear your browser cache if you know what that means and how to do it. So three strategies if you really don't want to pay $5 a month. And, and just the, the counter argument on that is that people who write articles for Medium and, and Brian, I'm not sure if you're an author, but if not, you should mm -hmm. be, but authors in, in Medium. So Medium actually pays people who contribute content. So when you do create a paid subscription to Medium, you're actually supporting authors like Brian who produce content there that get, um, they get small compensation based on, there you go, based on articles that they write. So cool hacks to get around it if you can't afford it. And if you can't afford it, then it helps the authors who, who are there. Yep. If you write for Medium and you're a paying member, your views and then applauding the articles is what gives the people you're, you're reading money. So yeah, I, I make a couple articles on Medium when I can. And it's actually a, a better ROI than YouTube ad revenue sometimes. So yeah, it does help. Okay, so you have all this content here and, and you consume it in and watch Brian's lengthy video to sh he shows how he goes through Raindrop to extract this and then and the tagging system he uses in Raindrop so that stuff shows at the top or the bottom once he's consumed it and read it and processed it. He has tags that, that he uses for that. All that's, all that's in his article. But so these inputs come in. They, they spur your ideas, they turn into these seedlings, perhaps they become evergreen notes, but it all goes into Obsidian, all into this, 
this massive knowledge base that you're building. And it links together as you learn new things, you create these connections and, and it grows. And it's really cool that it's helping you with, with learning, with, with the jobs that you're doing. So let's see when you want to pull up a bunch of notes on your desk, so to speak, and kind of look at them side by side. How do you do that? And there's a new feature in Obsidian within the past week for plugins. Can you show us what that is? How you, how you install a plugin? What is a plugin? How do you install it? And how did you get these cool sliding pins in your... Show us that. Yeah. So the sliding pains, we know him as death underscore AU, probably for Australia where he's yes. at. Yep. But um, Gordon is a super friendly guy. I really, really like he Gordon. Is. He is. Um, not only is he a friendly guy, not only is he a, a design wizard, but he's a really good guy, like just a, a quality individual. I yes, had I had the opportunity to have him on on the on the program, and he's he's one of the Obsidian moderators, and just yeah, a real quality individual. I think I'm the first non-moderator you've had on here. The, yeah, you are, in fact, and you will be back once we once we turn this into a live. We will eventually have the office hours as live, so that people can not not only watch it live but ask questions in. So these first few are are recorded, but. Brian, we'll definitely have you back when we have a live program because we're going to want to go through some of your grep stuff. We're going to want to showcase some of your, your terminal wizardry. All right. So back to death and Gordon Peterson. Tell us about plugins. What are plugins? How do you get started with a plugin? Where do you find them? So the plugin features and the API to build the plugins, everything is in new in the, the latest few releases from the devs for Obsidian. And it's now no longer a janky system of extending the functionality with uh, the Volcano uh, Injector <laughs> that, um, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but Cognis or something produced. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. That, that was awesome. I was using Volcano for um, Gordon's initial Andy mode. With the CSS. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had the CSS, but the actual plugin had one, th uh, the, the Volcano plugin had one thing that I was missing, which is if I go to the left here, it will stack up the panes yep. over here. Shoot. It'll stack up the panes on the left like that. But yep. on the right, it was not it stacking. Just, it would just before. scroll right off to the right. Yeah. So and, that's one reason I was using that. And also, if I'm not mistaken, when you closed a tab, it left that, that weird no note mm. uh, command end to oh, create a new note or O oh, to open. So, okay. So plugins, where do you find them? Uh, you can find them on, if you're on the type two search it, you can search for GitHub and you can find them on GitHub tagged with obsidian or obsidian dash MD. There's now a new interface in the settings menu for third-party plugins. They, you know, it is a risk to use other people's software beyond the devs. So you have to evolve, you have to opt in saying, I don't want to be safe. And, you know, and just to, away. for what we're looking at here. So, so Brian is an insider. And so he's showing us an insider build here. Mm -hmm. So this may, some of the things you see here may or may not be available for, for the general release, but, but go ahead, Brian. For a few weeks, because yeah. good gosh, their, their iterative cycle is insane. They're pretty fast. It's, it's great. It's, it's one of the, one, another great quality of Obsidian is not just the platform, but the developers are just, they're, they're superstars and, and they're so responsive to the community. And, and speaking of which, the community is just one of the things that we all love. Okay, so third-party plugins. Yeah, so once you've opted in to uh, have them used on your vault, which you have to opt in for, you can browse for the community plugins. And this is the same as the color themes that we have where you can just you know, search for color themes. So we're going to search for community plugins and it will list off everyone who's listed as a community plugin. And I'm not sure how they set this up. I haven't looked too much at it yet, but um, like how to get on this list, but you can manually install these plugins. Um, I actually had some issues with that. So personally, I would just say, just stick with this menu because this made it a lot easier, but you can see, I have three of these installed. Two of them are by Gordon. And one of them is by Liam Kane. This is the calendar plugin for the daily notes. 
and it shows you like a link to the GitHub profile where they're hosting this code. So you can go look at it if you want to. What version are you up to date? You can update if you're not, what it's about. And it shows you the GitHub readme and some details about this plugin. And you can do this for any of these other ones. I don't have this one. I could add it if I wanted to. You know, some examples of what it looks like. Yeah. So this is how you would get them. You just click install and then you have it. You'd actually need to turn it on after that. And maybe, and it's probably just a good practice to do it anyways, uh, restart Obsidian afterwards. So I've turned on all three of these. So showing white space, my calendar plugin and the sliding panes and what those look like. So sliding panes are, if I am, let's just close a bunch of these and go to um, programming. So if I'm programming, I have a list of a lot of other links so I can just open up. I'm, I'm on Mac and I might have custom hotkeys. I'm not sure, but I'm just going to hold command shift and open C++ that opens in a new pane. Now, instead of just being directly next to it or below it, it opens up in a side uh, directly to the side. But if I click another one, instead of taking up a third of the screen each, what's going to happen is I can click this and now I can scroll and I can scroll on this new note. And as I continue to click notes, um, if I could find one with other links. So I could go over here and I could actually open up new notes sideways and continue scrolling through these. So this is what actually makes up for the lack of, you know, spreading note cards out on a desk, like the analogs that'll cost in method is that now I have digital notes, quote unquote, spread out over my desk because now I can scroll through them like this. And not only scroll through, line them all up on one side and then click the title of one of them. It mm -hmm. will automatically and shoot you okay. all the way back to that one. Yep. And one of the things I love about this sliding panel mode is you can always have the note that you're working on front and center, which I'm not a fan of kind of having to turn my head and type or move my chair one way or the other. You know, I like having the note I'm working on right there in front of me and sliding panels works great for that, except for the very left note and the very far right note. You, you need to add a little padding there on those. <laughs> I actually really like working with the, the panes like this when I'm actually developing my seedlings from my literature notes, because what it, a live view of what that might look like, like if I was in how to take smart notes, um, is I would just be here and then I would make this a link and then I'd open up that link and now it's in a new pane here and I can you know type it out, make it into an incubated note and then have all of them open in one go and I can easily slide through them. And because they're all coming from the same literature source, they're probably related. So I link them to each other densely before I then find a home for them in the main vault, which then makes them evergreen. And that's typically how I also really leverage these panes for my actual workflow. That's really, really cool. And you mentioned that you do use tags for, I presume, to see, show me my seed links that I haven't yet converted into evergreen notes so that you could, if you're in that mode of, hey, I want to work on my notes and, and sort of, you know, flow those through, you could easily do that. Yes. Um, one, I could just click on them in the tag pane here, which gives me a tag list of them. So if I want to look for my current seedlings, I can just, you know, click on my tag here and it opens up in this. I don't really prefer using that. I don't really care for that as much. Um, it's a possible functionality. One thing I really like to do is in my graph, I can easily just find out which one is here or I could filter by you know, tag is equal to the tag. And then, so I could search for the tag by then saying, um, and I wanna look for evergreen notes and then search and it'll find that tag for evergreen notes and everything related to them. So oh, cool. So I really enjoy this on the graph, especially with uh, local graph too, because then I can see um, anything related to the actual note or just the tag itself. So I like being able to just go to, go to my tag, see, ah, all my evergreen notes, click on it. It opens up the same search, but yeah, just the graph being able to hover and see what's evergreen. It's just so, so nice that we have this on the graph. Now I remember when it mm -hmm. came out, it, it, was, it was a great day. The calendar plugin is really, really useful. I can't show you any of my actual daily notes because- Oh, but if you it. click on it, it takes you to a daily note. Okay, that's nice. That's a, that's a cool feature. It'll take you to a daily note. But uh, one thing I can show you is that tomorrow, Halloween, I don't have a daily note because it's not tomorrow yet. 
But with the calendar plugin, um, first of all, the dots will show you how much you've written that day, which is really cool. But if I click a day where I don't have a daily note, it'll prompt me and say, hey, you want That's to create nice. one? Because it doesn't That's exist. Nice. And then it will actually use my um, prompt. Oh, there's your template. Yep. That's cool. And so, and one thing I do for my notes that link them together, because um, if you saw my graph, the, uh, I'll get back to that. But when I have the dates, I actually have an Alfred snippet because um, the functionality is not quite there yet in Obsidian, I don't think. So I just run date and it will yeah. actually do the prior day today and tomorrow. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. And that way I can easily link to jump from yesterday and today. That's a clever but, idea. Yeah. But I don't actually link. Like, what was I going to say? I don't actually click on these. This is actually more for uh, the graph. Because one thing I noticed with some people who are actually making notes or converting systems where they've been in other note-taking systems like VimWiki or something for years, and they have tons of daily notes, is that their graph looks like you know their web network, yeah. and then like the the situation of the Earth with all the satellites we have exactly just it. all these it's just with nothing connected to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like that yeah. scene from Wall-E where you just have all of the satellite clutter <laughs> around the planet. So right. I actually wanted to get away from that. And one thing that um, one of the other mods names always escape me. Oh, it's Ryan Murphy. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it was Ryan Murphy that gave me the idea because he actually connected all of his prior daily notes, I know, connected them to each other. And so I just did did it with an Alfred snippet. And now like all of them are connected to each other. And when they have literature notes, they're connected to, which are connected to normal, right. you know, idea notes, then it's all basically a tangle, which looks better. But yeah, I also didn't want the, the, the satellite clutter. This has been awesome, Brian. So tell us what's, what's on the horizon, what videos are coming from you, both in the productivity world, knowledge management world, as well as in the ADHD world, what's, what's coming up? What can we look forward to on your channel? So as far as my channel, I don't really make too much content on ADHD specifically. I kind of made that one video so that whenever people ask me questions, I can refer to them just because I don't really think that's what my audience is there for as much. But uh, I'm always doing uh, like live streams and I answer questions about it all the time and that's totally fine. But as far as like personal knowledge management and Obsidian, um, I do actually today have plans to script and film a couple of videos, one specifically on getting completely set up A to Z on the Zotero workflow that a lot mm -hmm. of people talk about and post and that I try to prolifically share in the server and how to use that with research papers and getting notes into Obsidian. I wanted to actually do like an announcement because I'm surprised Nick hasn't actually already beat me to the, the punch here with making the announcement of the plugin system and the API, but I'll probably do that. And then cool. um, a couple other pieces of my workflow, probably. Awesome. It's so great kind of seeing all the work that you're doing, both helping people with their personal knowledge management systems, as well as, you know, what you're doing yourself, how you're using it to, to kind of grow yourself and grow your knowledge, knowledge base. So. Thank you for all that you're doing. And I appreciate, even though you don't, you're not making more videos on this, at least publicly, I appreciate all that you're doing to help people who are struggling with ADHD. I appreciate your, your courage to kind of talk about that and share that. And um, we expect big things from you. So, <laughs> and we'll have you back on here to do a live session with some of the things that, that we spoke about. But thanks so much for, for sharing today and yeah, for all that you do, Brian. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure.